Good evening, students. Welcome to another edition of Detention, where we talk with high performers in the endurance sport world. Tonight, we are super excited because we are finally sitting down with Elliot Bassett, owner of Mountain Endurance, a coaching company in Montana. Uh, Elliot has always aimed at being an endurance coach, starting his educational career at the University of Montana, focused on getting a BS in exercise science. Uh, he carried that theoretical study over to the triathlon club there, building training programs for the student athletes between 2002 and 2006. Elliot then continued his university studies at the University of Victoria, completing an MS in exercise science there. Since then, he has coached more than 30 elite athletes, along with many high-performing age group athletes. Some of his notable athletes include Ben Hoffman, Erica Ockerlin, who you will be seeing here soon, uh, Matt Lieto, Fiona Moriarty, Chris McDonald, and former detention guest Jesse Vondracek. Elliot believes in understanding the stresses his athletes undergo, and he has the muscle biopsy scars to prove it. Elliot, welcome to detention. <laughs> Molly, Chris, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, stoked to uh, stoked to finally get some time to like sit down and chat with you face to face. You know, we've known each other for a while, but haven't gotten a chance to ever really do this. Um, Elliot, we uh, we hit every guest with the same first couple of questions. Um, is this your first time in detention? <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I've been suspended, but never detention. So yeah. Okay. So tell us that story. Uh, well, I was the smallest kid in school, and I also wrestled. So yeah, I was four ten, and the other guy was six two. And let's just say I had zero black guys, and he had two. Um, but yeah, that's actually a true story. That's a you asked. You asked. That's the truth. Don't mess with a guy who's wrestled a lot. So, Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <Love> it. <laughs> that is, uh, that's one of the better answers we've gotten so far. Uh, yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the triathlon world are, are a whole bunch of goody two shoes we've mm -hmm. discovered. I mean, I didn't start the fight, but he was picking on my friend and I made fun of him and he literally punched me. So there you go. That's how the fight gets It was started. eighth grade. I, I don't think I've been in a fight since then. It makes it feel any better. So Hey, yeah. you're 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 one and oh. That's a good record. <laughs> I'm bad, a lot better than that if you count wrestling it. matches, but yeah. For sure. So uh, the Endurance School, as we were talking about before, is kind of our COVID project. Um, it was something that we started thinking it would last only a couple of weeks, and now nearly a year later, here we are. Um, what has 2020 given you the time to, to get into in your life that you wouldn't otherwise have had time for? What has it freed up space for, for you? Oh. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I, uh, honestly, I, it's been probably one of the most challenging years to keep my athletes, um, really focused mm -hmm. and to like come up with, and everyone's so different in how they're handling and where they are in the world and where they are in their, their sport. So so like my girlfriend was asking me like hey the world shut down and i was like just working uh for for my athletes who've who've known me i think they know i like i spend a lot of time on each individual plan and i really try to get to know each athlete so for me it was just like how do i keep people sane um through like this ever-changing we don't have any idea what's going to happen so unfortunately nothing but i will say in the last three days I started playing chess online and I won my last six games. So I'm really happy. That's um, fantastic. Congratulations. Is this because of the queen's gambit, like much of America right now or. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can blame Lindsay Corbin. She told me to watch it, but I haven't watched it. And I, instead I just started playing chess. So skip right yeah, to that. We'll get, end we'll get to it. Once, <laughs> yeah, it's, the, it's the next thing in the, in the Netflix. Too. It's so good. Uh, so then like <laughs> next question about chess, have you and Lindsay Corbin played chess now? No, slept in the same bed. Yes, Play chess. <laughs> we were Excellent. very broke in college, and I was apparently the only trustworthy guy. So yeah, her, her yeah, her husband always likes to be like Elliot's the only guy that can hang out with with uh, Lindsay with no consequence. I'm like the little <laughs> brother. So. She's a yeah. good judge um, of character too. <laughs> yeah, we we met my freshman year of college, so oh my yeah, God. before either of us knew how to swim. Um, so if you don't mind, like lingering on the topic of what you've been doing this year, like, um, what have been some, you talked about ways of keeping your athletes engaged. Um, what have been some of those 
uh, tactics that you've gone to to keep athletes focused, engaged, excited? What have you kind of pulled out of your bag of tricks? Um, depending on who they are, where they are, I've done like consistency challenges, essentially just do X amount of this kind of workout in this amount of days. I've had a lot of people who opted for pretend races where we just straight up like trained for a 40K, trained for a 5K. Um, and for a lot of people, it was like big adventures that you didn't necessarily get to do in the middle of summer. Um, and some people it was like lots of time off when they maybe wouldn't have had time off. So it would be like, not personally, but like, they were like, I want to bake this weekend instead of whatever. And I said, okay. But like, like just kind of like managing that as, as the ebb and flow of, of, um, various lockdowns have, have changed. So those are the, the main ways. I can only assume that the baking was Fiona. Is that, <laughs> is that accurate? No, because Fiona was doing, Fiona was doing like time trial, multiple time trial challenges and the baking. Oh, so okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, okay. she's getting a lot done. So. I can't look at her Instagram if I'm not intending to eat right away. <laughs> or see <laughs> a puppy. All, yeah, it's all gluten free too. Yeah, yeah. So it's very impressive. Pretty impressive, yeah. Um, so uh, we're still in kind of warm-up questions. You just told us right before we went live that you once had the nickname Odd Job. Uh, would you tell our audience uh, how you arrived at that nickname? Well, so you guys actually said I graduated from University of Victoria. I went to University of Victoria for grad school. I did a year and I quit. Long story short, they didn't give me the money I was promised. I was in Canada. I, did, I couldn't work. So I came back to Montana. When I came back, I was teaching spin class I was teaching in essentially in old people exercise class. I'm pretty sure the people seeing me can see I'm doing quotes it's where I did my physical therapy and taught it to elderly people uh, and got paid for it. But I was working at a bakery. I was, I was actually coaching at that time. I, I think I probably had two athletes who were paying me. Um, I was painting houses. I honestly can't remember. I think that's the summer I was digging ditches in the mountains somewhere, putting in weather satellites, like all sorts of weird stuff. So that was like for a year and a half. Good times. Yeah. Amazing. Then we get oddball Bassett. I yeah. love it. So through this whole time, um, was physiology always an interest of yours? You say on your on your website that a coach should really understand um, their athletes' physiology. How did you How did you arrive at that perspective? Um, in my sophomore year of high school, I found a book in study hall that was written by the Eastern Bloc Germans. I think it was published in 1987. So if you now looking back at it, I realized that information was heavily based in a bunch of people who were doping people. Um, but at the time I, it was, it was track and field based. So I remember like I spent, I must've read the decathlon section 20 times. And I realized that like the people who were doing this training had all these scientific reasons for making decisions. So then I went to the, my normal public library, not my high school library and found like all your standard Jack Daniels and, and um, serious training for serious runners. And, and basically we had a massive library of sports science books. And I found a, a couple books. One in particular was by the Australian Institute of Sport. And they like had a section on how their coaches became coaches. And it just said, like, one of the things was like, you have to have this massive background in physiology along with all this other stuff. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like, if you, if you want to learn how to make a decision, you should, you should know how the body works. Um, and, and then basically, then I started researching how coaches became coaches. And then I realized like the physiology part was more or less the backbone. And then that's where I decided to, that's how I chose my college and all of that stuff. And I didn't know how to swim bike and I barely was running at the time I was a wrestler, but I was always interested in travel on it from watching it on TV. I think we'll come back to the wrestling part later because that's yeah. always I'm always <laughs> interested in um in people, wrestlers or fighters or there's always an interesting application i think to endurance sports yeah. um but um is there is there an element of physiology that you find like more interesting than other areas like do you have a favorite uh do you have a favorite system do you prefer the krebs cycle to the <laughs> adenosine triphosphate uh yeah uh, um creatine like, phosphate system <laughs> the my hardest class i ever had in college it was in grad school and it was neural physiology and i gave a presentation and, and like and so in grad school if you don't get an a or b it's essentially failing right 
and um, I gave a presentation and I remember I was sitting there and I think I got a C plus because the professor was nice. And I was like, this is an absolutely, I do not understand neurophysiology on the level I'm supposed to understand it. But compared to your average triathlon coach, I'm like leagues ahead. Um, I think that stuff is super interesting to me. So like in anything that's like, and just uh, like how you can track muscles from, from like a neural level, I, I think that the nervous system, I guess, is the one I would find the most interesting and probably the one most overlooked. All those other ones are like the most important, but they're not the most interesting to me. So. And, ha and has that shown up in your work, like that interest in, in neurophysiology? Like has that, um, has that, have you applied that in, uh, in your coaching? A hundred percent. You guys are going to have to send me a big bill for the next answers, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it does in, in it's something as simple as like you're training for three sports at once. So like, how can you be like massively aerobically fit in three things at once? Well, you kind of can't. And how can you have like, how can you be fast in three sports at once? Like you almost kind of can't, but then you look at the best athletes and they really legitimately are. Like if you look at a top level ITU athlete, they're essentially like they're beyond the all state level of a swimmer, biker, runner. They're essentially like a, an all conference division one level swimmer, biker and runner at the same time is about what it takes um, to be in the top like 20, 30, 40 in the world on the ITU level. And you think like, how the heck is that even possible? And I think it's just like a commitment to like making sure is your, do you have the efficiency to even do the specific sports at that, at those speeds? Um, and then do you also have the endurance? So I don't know if that answers the question, but yes. Yeah. I think that's an awesome answer. I mean, I okay. think, um, you know, cause it's so, I mean, I think we're just getting to these places of understanding like central and peripheral. I think that like, that that's stuff that people are, are only starting to apply in like triathlon coaching. And so like that next level of like neural fatigue and like how you actually do movements is, is like that stuff that I wish I knew how to do. <laughs> I, I, now you're making me question everything that I do, but like, <laughs> I'm like, I gotta hit the books, but like, I, yeah, at the baseline, it's, yeah, it, it's important to me, I would say. Cool. Yeah. It's important enough that you've actually been involved with some um, some experiments and like testing and stuff. Can you can you tell us any about about that experience? Yeah, I was super lucky. So University of Montana, when I went there, the exercise physiology program, one of the professors, he was the U.S. Nordic combined coach. So that's cross country skiing and ski jumping um, he was the national team coach for a decade, maybe a little more. And he had some great training history from the u.s national team coach and was comparing it to what they're doing in nordic countries and he's originally i think he's norwegian steve gaskell's his name he's actually my neighbor now um and and then brent ruby who is pretty well known like he if you heard the mcdonald's study where like mcdonald's is great for recovery that's brent um we did a bunch of the work on the formulation we me being a subject but also like i was a lab rat i was a whatever you want to call it like an assistant um, and he did a lot of the work on developing that original Gatorade endurance. And then also the power bar, whatever the first power bar, like sugar one was, or, I'm not, I'm saying the wrong. Right? Yeah. Power bar perform. Yeah. So like yeah. I was a subject, like I did like place boo, not place boo on a lot of the tests for that stuff. Cool. Um, and, and I was in the lab my entire college career, those four years plus the year after. And then I went to grad school, did even more of it, came back and then was a subject again. So for a while I had the most muscle biopsies of anyone in the lab. I was at like 28 and then my best friend, my best friend went and, and beat me by like two um, just to beat me. But I didn't even know you could compete in muscle biopsies and I feel like I'm way behind now. <laughs> I mean, have you ever had like a time who can go up and down the stairs, multiple different running styles competition? Because that was the college that, house that. There are so many things I've done wrong until this point. <laughs> yeah. So like, and Ben Hoffman lived in that house too. And he was oh not God. the fastest that classical or um, orthodox stair climbing in case you were wondering. So wait, what wait, it, class, classical and orthodox yeah. are two different. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Classical wait. was one and maybe it was freestyle was the other. Classical okay. so it's. So we're, so it's Nordic skiing, but applied yeah, to yes. stair climbing. <laughs> it was, it was up and down the stairs. You had to hit every step up and down and then freestyle. And then the guy who set the freestyle record jumped the whole 15 steps 
oh. and super messed up his body, but set the record yeah. and no one ever beat him again. That yeah. sounds worth yeah, it's, it. It's freestyle. You can do it any way you want. Yeah. Yeah. Great cool. swimmer too. So. <laughs> up until the time that he triumphed in the freestyle <laughs> stair competition, he was yeah. an amazing. <laughs> Rest oh, yeah. in peace, whoever yes. you were. <laughs> What was the test that involved you riding your bicycle from Montana to Colorado? It was called the Jure Discovery. So I was a subject in that one. Okay. Um, I, I would have only amassed six muscle biopsies on that one. Oh, God. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's a DVD somewhere around here. I think it's actually on YouTube if you look up like Jure Discovery. Um, there's like a 37 minute video. Um, so the, the subject, the study was we took a VO2 max test. You got a muscle biopsy. We were doing, we were taking blood, saliva, urine, resting heart rate. We had the early power meters. This was 2007. Um, we all had the same bikes and there was 10 of us. So then we rode, we did all the testing. We rode 10 days in a row, hundred miles a day. Every third day you did an hour time trial as fast as you could. We got <sighs> tested again. Then we rode a hundred. It was actually 105, but whatever. Um, and we rode from Montana to Colorado and back. And so we, we were given blood and everything every three days. We did saliva every day. Um, and they just ran a gamut of tests on us, but we were all fast. So like Chris, you would have raced Adam Jensen back in the day. Uh -huh. and may maybe Matt Shryock, he was there. Multiple guys who were like um, racing the national race calendar for cycling. But there was only two of two people, two out of the ten who like never raced pro, if you will. Um, so, um, yeah, that was a pretty great experience to just ride a ton with a bunch of really fast people and um, go really fast. I think at one point we we as a group, my my one buddy rode like 37 miles an hour for like five straight miles, not down a hill, um, <laughs> just because we were racing each other for fun. So good times. Uh, what was the study design like what were you trying what were they trying was, to figure out <laughs> yeah everything everything so the actual the bummer about it is so the most interesting stat we got out of it was obviously we were like i think i did a 42 hour week in there it, it was just riding but um i mean i've done plenty of 30 and 35 hour weeks on my own but like 40 42 was special um and and the only like they found a lot of things out like um my friend Adam, he's actually a dentist. He, he was doing a study on us on the side and it was essentially testing our teeth enzymes. And it was, the take home was like, you can drink Gatorade all day and your teeth will be okay. But it was, it was a 10 person study, but we were drinking insane amounts of Gatorade. The study was sponsored by Gatorade. Um, the what did that other find? <laughs> that you, that your teeth were not negatively affected. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Okay. Good to know. But it was only 10 people, but it okay. was pretty conclusive for the 10 of us. Great. Um, the other thing it found that seemed pretty clear was in the first 10 days of this massive block of volume, everyone had a massive bump in fitness. Um, and then the next 10 days. So like if you did a 10 day training block versus a 20, the bump in fitness was like negligible over the next 10. Huh. And, and it kind of depended. There's, it, we were already a somewhat elite group, if you will. Um, and a couple people were like trailing off and getting weaker. And then a handful of people were still getting stronger. And, and so, but if you were going to, my takeaway from the study is like, I'm cool with somebody doing a seven to 10 day massive volume block. Um, as long as you recover afterwards from that block but that's really the only real takeaway a lot of this if you talk to some of the scientists i think they'd say like it was a heck of a lot of work and we didn't find a ton of great information so bummer but super fun <laughs> our next question was uh basically what's the hardest thing you've ever done in search of like answers about physiology uh, is that was that it or is there something else um we so actually Lindsay Corbin was was a she was a lab rat in our so she she was uh in the lab as well for some of these we had to do these eight hour studies and ten hour studies where you were fifty five minutes of every hour you were either on a bike riding walking uphill and I think some of them had a skier and you'd do fifty five minutes on and then you'd like switch your shoes or I can't remember exactly but some of those you had to do with no calories and it was ten straight hours. And you had like placebo and i think maybe you got like 200 calories at lunch so that was really boring especially, the, especially when you came back for the second and third time 
Um, and it was not nearly as fun as just riding your bike all day with your buddies and having to do a barrage of tests to start and begin with. But yeah, I, I totally fell asleep on the side of a road in Wyoming during the study. And that's a real thing that happened. And I also like somewhat illegally hopped in the back of someone's truck through a gravel road section that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, so like maybe the, maybe the trip was the hardest. <laughs> uh, 55 minute session on the ski erg. That sounds terrible. It was, it, we, it, and with no food. It, it oh my perfect. God. Yeah. Oh, um, one awful. of our, uh, one of our previous guests earlier this year, uh, was at the OTC in the early nineties. I was like, he was, he was like in that he was in, he was a, a, a really good bike racer, but mm -hmm. it wasn't, wasn't like quite there, but he was there in the realm of like the days of Hinkopy and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, he told us a story about falling asleep on the ergometer during a repeated sprint workout. <laughs> um, and he said that the coaches knew it was going to happen and would wake you up when it was time for your sprint <laughs> and you would do your sprint fall asleep and then 20 or 30 seconds later they would wake you up again you would sprint <laughs> like i mean just absolutely terrible things um, that sounds way worse yeah. <laughs> yeah not as bad as me so um, you also did some work with the University of Montana Triathlon Club. Can you tell us uh, what some of what you what you did with them and some things you took away from that experience? Yeah, I mean, I like to say I didn't major in exercise physiology. I majored in triathlon. Nice. Um, and so I was the club president from my sophomore year to my senior year. Um, so the club started the year before I got there. And they promptly won nationals with seven kids. It takes six to win. Um, that was back when, before it was really how it is now. It was just a combo race at Wildflower, so it wasn't quite what it is. The first ever race where there was a true USA triathlon nationals was my freshman year. Um, and I was on that team, didn't know what I was doing, didn't know how to swim, bike, or run, joined the team figured it all out on my own because they didn't really have a program and it was really frustrating but I met another freshman my friend Jeff who knew how to swim and I had run in high school and we kind of like traded off services but he also worked at a bike shop so he like taught me how to ride um, and then turned out I was really gung-ho to try whatever and so we were both these freshmen who no one was helping we showed up we ended up getting second at nationals basically because me and Jeff were fast um, and so like Jeff ended up getting third, he beat me by 50 seconds, but we were the third slash fourth man. And that's how we ended up getting second place overall. Um, and then all those guys graduated and then it was just me and Jeff. And we were like, well, we want to keep doing this. We were clearly good enough to be somewhat useful. Um, and then my sophomore year was just recruiting people. And then my junior year, um, I was, I wanted to coach and recruit cause we had recruited enough people to actually coach them. And then by my senior year, I was just like full on running a program. But so like Lindsay joined the team because of essentially my recruitment. Same with Ben, Adam Jensen. So seven other people who were ended up racing professionally. Um, and I was on the team and I was coaching. So we had Chad Latino who yelled at us and I told him what the workout was and he would scream at us. So I'd be like in the pool and he'd be screaming my own workout back at me. Um, and he like at nationals one year he had a rolled up newspaper with numbers written all over it and i came up to him after the the race and was like chad what do all the numbers mean he goes like i don't know i'm just writing <laughs> stuff down screaming at you guys and so that was like the i was like the coach but like if you asked like Lindsay or ben i wasn't the coach chad was the coach he was like the rah rah he like made us be kind of a team and i was the one who organized when we actually had the pool time and I was the one who made sure we had a workout at the pool and I was the one who said okay we meet at three here we're gonna ride to here then this is where the time trial loop is so I figured all that out but then he would like be there to tell us and then I was the athlete so I got to ease into it and then after I graduated I stayed in town and I like really coached the whole thing and was like just doing it all and then that's the year we won we won nationals so I guess I was the I was the full coach of that team in 2006. What lessons from that time did you like, have you carried into the rest of your coaching career? Um, the, the biggest one is it's gotta be fun and like community helps a lot. And I coach a lot of people remotely, but I feel like it's really important to like 
give people the tools that their workouts can help develop their own community. So like being open to the idea of like somebody doing their workout slightly differently, if that, if it fits their personality for them to like have a buddy to swim, bike or run with, um, that's probably like the biggest thing. So, yeah. So as a lot of, uh, a lot of great coaches do, um, you have talked about letting the athletes determine the approach for kind of how the, how that relationship goes. How do you get to know what approach will work best with the athletes that you work with? I ask a boatload of questions <laughs> and I try to listen as best I can. <clears throat> and then I expect for it to change, um, because everyone, people change huh. and as you learn about new workouts and then as you execute a new workout differently, it like changes your perspective on the workout. So like, it's like, it's the same, like you never cross the same river twice. It's the same thing. Like you never coach the same athlete twice because the athlete's always changing. And so like every week is always different. And if you're not paying attention to like how that, I often notice a change in the athlete and how they're executing a workout before they do. But, it, but like, and, and sometimes I can just like miss it. Right. And, um, and so it's just like, I'm always aware of the fact that I might be about to, I might be on, I'm on the verge of missing something really important. So if I'm not paying attention, I'm probably about to screw up. Um, so like, yeah, it's just mostly just a ton of questions. And sometimes I ask really weird questions just because I'm like looking for anything different, just to see if there's a bit of insight to learn from that. What do those changes in workout execution or like question responses signal to you? Um, I don't know if I quite understand. Like you're saying like if they didn't work out differently. Yeah. Like when you notice, um, you, when you said that, you know, the approach may change, um, and that athletes, you know, that they're, they're constantly changing. Um, when you notice yeah. a change like that, what is that, what does that like cue you to do next? Like to, to figure out where it's coming from or does it, do you change something? No, about... no, 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 no. Yeah. You, you just like, you just, you just become aware of it. Like, Oh, this, this is how this person views, views a tempo run, <laughs> right? Like the word tempo can mean so many things to so many people. Yeah. And so like my, one of my main jobs is just like, what does the word tempo mean to you? Mm -hmm. And so like when I write one person's workout, it doesn't mean the same thing. So like, I, so like for tempo, I could use like steady i could use tempo i could use like marathon pace i could use easier than marathon pace but like the what i'm looking for is a specific stress but it's like what is the word that makes the athlete do the correct stress or do the, st the stress i'm looking for and that we're on the same page and then also that the athlete is confident that that stress is actually going to help them and then you either have to convince them like this is the reason why or if they're like, that is not fun. I hate that. <laughs> then you think, okay, well, that stress is off the table because they hate it. And if there's one thing that's going to make you slow, it's making someone do something they hate over and over. So then I have to find a new stress. But I mean, like the great thing is there's, there's a million different kinds of ways to elicit a stress in an athlete, especially in triathlon. Like nobody's peak performance in all three sports. So then you just have to find a new different way to get faster at triathlon as opposed to swim bike run. If you, if you can, and, and maybe this is, maybe this is splitting hairs too much. Um, what are some of the, what are some of those different stresses that you try to impose upon your athletes? Um, no, the, the, so it's whatever, like it's whatever will help them. Like you have an right. athlete who's a swim bike run, right? What are they weakest at? Right. Like, so just, you can make up a fake athlete. Are they weakest at the swim, bike or run? Here we'll go. But I, I am, I am, my weakness is you, definitely the run. Okay. So your, weak, <laughs> your weakness is the run. And then what part of running are you bad at? Like, are you bad at a 400? Can you not run far? Are you injury um, I, prone? I'm spe very speed limited. Okay. Uh, you're speed, speed, limited. speed and injury limited. Okay. So then to me, it would be like, okay, what's the stress we need? We just need probably consistency. And then part of it would be like, are, are you actually injury? Like, is it, is, it a, is it a landing force thing? And so like figuring out from there. So then I'm just like, what is the stress that gets you to be a healthier runner or a more consistent runner? And then how can we bring in speed in a way that wouldn't elicit injury? Got it. Right? So instead of, instead of you having a sort of like menu of stresses that you're looking to apply, 
you're kind of like, okay, like what are the, you go looking for the stresses that's going to make the athlete faster or more resilient or more efficient. I'm, I'm, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a little different. I'm looking for the area where the athlete needs to improve. And mm -hmm. then I look for what stress would help that athlete improve in that manner. So that's the, like, that's, if you don't make that change, then it doesn't work. Yeah. Or I mean, it'll work, but maybe not as efficiently. No, I love that. That's a really cool, that's a really cool, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always, it's one of the things we always talk to people about on the show is, is process. And I think that hearing, because Molly and I have talked about the, the, the problem of the word tempo, like, which you just totally, like, which you just, you know, explained is that yeah. it just means so many different things to different people and thinking about it from a, a stress application method is a really, is a really cool way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's more or less what I'm, the only thing I'm thinking about is like what <laughs> needs to improve and how do you improve that while keeping someone injury free and healthy and, and happy. Yeah. Speaking of keeping people happy, um, how have you, how do you feel about all of the, uh, all the gravel biking that people have been doing in the, in the last couple of years? Well, I'm from Montana. So. <laughs> I started doing it on a triathlon bike many years ago because okay. that's where the roads are. We don't have that many of them. Um, and like, then it turns out I got a cross bike and it, yeah, I mean like to me, it's just funny because I'm like, well, Montana road races, like I, I race bikes a lot as well. Um, besides triathlon and, um, I've coached quite a number of cyclists and it's just no different to me. It's just like, oh, it's just a road race. It's just, there's not as much road. Um, I don't think. For a while, I think there was three races in all of Montana that didn't have gravel in them. Um, so anyways, that's like a Montana fun fact, but that's how it shapes me. I think it's great. I think people are enjoying it. Um, and that's really all that matters. It's safer, which is like, for me, like a, a big thing. It does change the dynamics. If you're like a really, like if you've spent a lot of time road racing, it totally changes the dynamics and what kind of strengths you need um, and, and how that's applicable. Um, but it's, it's awesome. And I think, you know, if triathletes want to get into it, I think it's an absolutely fantastic way to get ready for whether it's an Ironman or half Ironman or Olympic or whatever. Are the, uh, do you find the physiological demands of gravel, like lining up like nicely with triathlon? Do you yeah. see a, do you see a crossover between the sports? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's just like, it's threshold and endurance. Um, but if you don't have like specific bike race tactics, gravel can be pretty rough. And if you don't have certain, you know, like some of the people I coach, maybe they don't have like the skill. Um, not everybody's comfortable going 45 down a gravel road. Um, but you know, the scars aren't bad, that bad. I can show you a few. Um, but they just layer over the biopsy. Scars. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a beautiful <laughs> constellation. <laughs> That, there was a time where that's exactly what my left leg looked like. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, it's, it's, it's similar and, and it's similar enough. I would say if you know how to play it right, it could be really beneficial, especially because it's safer and it's like, it's a different way for someone who's been in the sport who doesn't want to leave trap on, but they want that like new motivation. It's a really good way to, to get into that. So. Um. So you've, you've coached a whole bunch of, of really high level athletes. Um, ben Hoffman is probably one of your more high profile cases, you know, mm -hmm. I think uh, out there. Uh, what's one of your proudest memories of working with Ben? Um, okay, so um, obviously I coached him forever. He, he won a lot of national championships and a lot of races. I coached him for 12 years um, and second and fourth at Hawaii were cool. But the coolest part was when he got second in Hawaii, we we're eating pizza the day after at this little pizza joint, like just me and him. Like basically we were just getting drunk, screaming second in the world. Um, and, and he was telling me about the race and he was like, yeah, man, I just kept like saying like, just look forward and breathe, look forward and breathe. And he's like, and I kept hearing people say that on the course and I'm like, and he's like, and just like, you know, and just like, there's people out there just telling me to look forward and breathe. And I'm like, yeah, you dummy. That was me every single time because, but like, it was cool because 
in when you're coaching someone, you're trying to get them to like focus on only a certain few things. And like Ben is an amazing athlete for a hell of a lot of reasons. Um, but one of them is like, I would say his focus and concentration is like the best, like one of the best in the world. That's how you get to be one of the best in the world. You're about the best of the world at something. Um, and he's like really intent and focused, but like that was what he was doing. And like Ben has a certain way when he's focused, when he's racing and he's just like, he's focusing on breathing and moving forward. And like, that's it. And it was really cool to me. Like, I was just like, Oh, like I actually helped him. Right. Cause you always have like the question, like how good, like, would he be if I wasn't there? And like, I, I've been helping him since like the beginning, like literally when he first came on the triathlon team, we did all our training together. Um, and, and so that to me, I was like, Oh, like that like really made a difference. Like all he was saying to himself is words I was saying, you know? So like that to me, I was like, yeah, that like kind of like helped me feel like a little bit validated. Cause like Ben is validated in the fact that he's the second fastest guy in the world. But like, I'm kind of just like a guy who's hanging around. So like, to me, it was like, personally, like, yeah, you did matter. So, I mean, like his parents tell me that, but he's not the best at it. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. I imagine that was incredibly gratifying. <clears throat> Yes. It, yeah. And, uh, Chris, uh, Matt Lieto's, uh, brother, um, as I like to call him, um, <laughs> uh, Chris Lieto went from calling me that guy who happened to coach his brother to all of a sudden he remembered my name like mid race. And I'm like, yeah, man, I know your son knows my name. It's about time. You know, my name too. But yeah, <laughs> that was good too. Yeah. I think that kind of dovetails into, uh, into one of the questions that we had for you. Um, we were talking about how like, in this whole triathlon space in coaching, especially, and I think in most, um, in most, uh, sports, even there's a, there's a real like habit of people to be strongly self self promotional. Um, and you have kind of like flown under the radar radar, but had a really successful career so far in, in coaching. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that, like how that has, has shaped up for you? Has that been intentional? And, and what do you think has, has gone into that? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit intentional. I mean, one, I'm not like, I'll meet a stranger and I'll talk to them about anything. Like if you're the guy next to me on the plane, if you start asking me questions, I'm going to answer them. Like, I'm, um, so I'm not like shy per se, but I'm not like, uh, like I wasn't on high school. I wasn't on message boards when AOL first came out. Like that's never really been my style. Um, and I get, I like to get to know people like in person or like via zoom works too um but, live, live um, on twitch <laughs> yeah live on twitch um so like that like i do well like interacting one-on-one -on -one with people and and i feel somewhat uncomfortable with like an online persona and and i don't think there's anything wrong with it i just personally feel uncomfortable with it um and and the other the, the bigger factor is um like the the athletes in the middle and like when you work with someone who's like trying to win a race right or whether it's the local 5k or whatever like winning is hard and i really don't like it when somebody works their ass off and then has to like go through the fight and then somebody else is like sitting on the sideline like they didn't do it without me and i'm like no they did it like they're the one who did the work like maybe like let them shine. Like it's really hard there. And, and an athlete only gets to be an athlete once. And like you said, I've worked with over 30 elite athletes. So like, like whatever, I can take 2% of the shine from, from 40 people and I'm good, you know, or 1%. Um, I don't really need that. I, what I do need and what I think is like, I mean, I've been coaching, like the only thing I've done is coaching for money for, for a decade. Um, and and before that like it was still a large portion of my income um and it's because like i'm gonna continue to get work because i continue to have good reviews and so like i i kind of like it's like you're only as good as your last athlete and so like that's a lot of to me it's like i don't want to be the coach who like coached a world champion 15 years ago or a guy who got second in this case and then you <laughs> just like roll with it i like i'm very proud of the fact that like my like two of the female pros I coach are essentially like the the biggest most like whoa who was that in ITU and like whoa who was that at Ironman Florida like I'm stoked on that but like at the end of the day I know that both of them did the work 
you know, like one of them's my girlfriend, but like while we're riding, she's in the other room doing her third workout of the day. Right. And so like, that's not easy to do your third workout of the day time and time again. Um, and when she does well, I think it's that she's the one who kind of like deserves the respect, if that makes sense. And, and I'm essentially a service. So I don't know if that answers it, but that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that athlete at Ironman Florida, um, <laughs> so uh, we're talking about uh, Fiona Moriarty here, I and uh, she's uh, yeah Portland local, going to come on detention uh, in January, we think. But um, so this is this is Fiona's debut Ironman, and she goes and uh, and gets fifth place. And like you said, people are like, oh my gosh, who's that? Um, you know, coaching anybody to Ironman is difficult. Coaching them to fifth place on debut is, even, <laughs> you know, even more difficult. What were some of the things that you did to prepare Fiona for the challenges of like the like a first Ironman? So th that's a very good question. And just to boost her horn a little bit, one Hoffman was sixth at his first Ironman. Um, two, <laughs> um, so Ben, take that. Um, and but two. <laughs> That was also essentially Fiona's first pro race. Her first pro race, she got a flat a mile in it. So she never really got to race a pro race. So it was her first time racing a pro field, really. Um, and three, she signed up for Ironman Arizona eight weeks or eight and a half weeks before the race. And then they changed it to Ironman Florida. So essentially she started training for that race six and a half weeks out. Now, was she training? Yes. Was she training well? Yes. Was she training for an Ironman? Oh, very much no. Um, so, I mean, she's the one who had to kind of like manage that emotional roller coaster and she did it super well. Um, and like, that goes to the last question. Like, I don't think you can, like, I'm not the expert here. Like she's the one who had to do it and she did it great. Um, but tools that I gave her, I like very much was like, yo, it's an iron man. You might die out there. Um, <laughs> and, and just like what did we do it was like mostly we just talked about eating you know like we might as well have been planning a picnic and like just kind of like say like hey what are you going to eat how's your stomach going to handle it um you know normally i'm not a huge fan of emodium but plenty of people i coach use it and it was just like hey this is like this is short notice like we've got to pull out all the stops like you're probably going to use emodium not because it's a good idea but because we don't know if you need it or not so i'd rather like have you be feeling terrible afterwards than just like have to take a million bathroom stops that's just part of the game um and then the other thing was i did like a little bit of a trick and uh, i don't know if she, she, i think i told her um so <laughs> fiona sorry but I, it was for your own good um so <laughs> i like i like casually i knew i wanted her to do this because her run fitness was going really well um I wanted her to take a walk break and I said for the first, I think I said the first five aid stations because I knew I'd never get her to agree to just walk all the aid stations. So I was like, I got to get her to just do the first few because one, it's hot. She didn't get to do any heat training because of COVID and she's in Portland um, and heat's not exactly her friend. Um, and so I was like, whatever we can do to like kind of manage that heat stress and like keep her in the game. So I just like, I basically said like, please, 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 will you walk through the first five aid stations and like get in all your fuel. And the other part of it was making sure she was hydrated and fueled. And then I was like, Fiona's a pretty smart racer. She's pretty smart in general. Um, and so it was like, eat all day on the bike, try not to go too crazy, not try not to get, have too many highs and lows and then walk those aid stations. And then she made the decision from there on out to continue walking them, even though she was running really well. Um, and, and that worked super well. And, and like, it was kind of like, I gave her the little nugget and then she took off and like did what professional athletes do and kind of knocked it out of the park. Very smart, Fiona. When you're on a uh, when you're on detention, we'll have, we'll ask you about how it feels to get tricked by your coach. Um, <laughs> and just for the record, speaking of getting giving credit to your coaches, even before we got to Fiona, she was in chat and talking about how you are an absolutely ninja spectator. So giving you lots of prop, props even before you mentioned her. Um, and yeah, uh, Elliot's spectating skills are are amazing. They're yeah, the stuff so. of legend. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I think uh, I I definitely have popped out on the on the Queen K or whatever it's called in Hawaii. Um, I know like one year when Lindsay, like Lindsay's like most pre 
crowd race she got 10th one year and like there's nobody out there because you have to go literally through the lava field so i'm like out there with no water and i'm covered in blood <laughs> it was a good Why? time it worked out uh because that was because the way the road closures worked you're allowed to be out there you're not allowed to run alongside anybody so I'm, I'm never i'm like always cognizant of like don't break any of the rules but it's just difficult to get out to certain parts of the course since then i've refined how i do it so um, was the blood from like lava falls then were you falling on lava it was from like the bushes that you had okay because you okay. have to go past you're allowed to be past there but you're not allowed to pass security so i had to like crawl through like a quarter mile of lava it was like shock sharp yeah. yeah yeah i i had no idea what i was getting into because i've done that at plenty of other races and i was like i did not fly all the way to hawaii to not cheer so, no <laughs> yeah. and then you have to like you have to do it like they're doing an iron man and like so like i had to like run like a 620 mile stop cheer for 30 seconds and then because you and then you have to go across the road so you're not pacing them and like when you pass them you better do it super fast and you can't talk to them and you wow. can only talk to him when you're standing still. So like, I'm very much a don't break the rules person, but like, that's how you have to do it. I hope your fueling plan was on target. That's a long, no, that's I a long and hard day. Out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, and, and you can't get, you can't get aid. Like the, I'd hate it for like the person who's trying to finish in 1650 at Ironman Hawaii to not have any yeah. water. So like you can't take anybody's fuel. Out there no, totally. Part of it. It's got to be your anaerobic background from wrestling. Allows right. you to sprint, sprint for a mile, <laughs> stop, like let yeah. all that pool go again. Yeah, real fast. <laughs> so. so we have a question from chat. Um, and Kirby would like to know if I, of what you, what you would like your legacy to be in the sport of triathlon. Oh, man. Um, if I'm going to be totally honest, like he was, he was polite. He was helpful. And um, I think mostly just I want like people like looking back and being like, I think he helped me, but I, there's no real way to know that. But like, hopefully, like I'm gonna rub some people the wrong way just because like if I think if I think you're gonna hurt yourself, I'm probably gonna tell you. Um, and so I know I've I've rubbed a few people the wrong way because I'm just like, hey, you need to like you need to eat more or you need to like not run as many miles. But like, hopefully, just that I'm coming from a good place and that. Um, that I got a lot of people into the sport. Like I've, I put on a, the biggest triathlon in Montana for a decade and it was essentially a beginner's triathlon. And, and that was the cool part to me. Just like, did I help grow the sport? Hopefully that's, I helped grow the sport. Great. Um, yeah. We got a few more minutes, but I, I do want to talk about wrestling um, yeah. because um, what, um, what mindsets or approaches have you brought from that background into triathlon? I think the biggest one is the way you win a race is you win the, you win the race. So like you can, you can, you, you can't really win a wrestling match unless you go out and like you score points, like mm -hmm. short of Rulon Gardner, if you know who he is, um, he won Olympic gold in 2000. He beat this guy who's essentially the greatest wrestler ever, um, essentially on a penalty point. So like, you can't, you can't, he beat the greatest wrestler ever off a of technicality. He didn't, I watched the match mm -hmm. and I was like, that's BS. He didn't win. But like short of that, if you watch Jordan Burroughs, who's like the best guy in the U.S. and arguably the world right now, Jordan wins. The, like you have to attack to win. And like in triathlon, it's an endurance sport, but you still have to like you have to put yourself out there. Right. So like winning requires putting yourself out there. And that it's the same thing like in bike racing. You can't win unless at some point you're at the front. And now you can be a sprinter and you can wait and wait and wait. But then it's like you have to know at that last bit like you're like it's if you've ever been in anything close to resembling one of those sprints like it's all on there's no mistakes you have to be super focused and you are going to take the win so i think that's like the biggest thing is like if you if you want something you have to go out and take it and it's like it's the you it's the one person you're the only one in the win, or in this case the race so. right um uh, we did pull some of your athletes for questions ahead of time and uh, fiona does want to know if you are ever going to return to racing Oh goodness. I mean, I, she, I don't know if I even told her, but I was on crutches in May cause I've, I've done a grade three sprain on both my left ankle twice, my right ankle once. So when I was 23, back when I was racing and like, not that much slower than Ben, I had, I had thoracic outlet syndrome. So 
I had nine doctors basically tell me like, hey, this is really bad. And five of them suggested I cut out the first rib. And at that time, this was 06, 07, like there's a real chance I would get my arm amputated. Um, so that's why like I never like raced pro or never took my pro card. Um, and like, then I kind of like dabbled in bike racing and like you did a marathon here or there, but like I never trained for any of them. Cause I'm like, I'm a triathlete by brain, but then the races I had to do weren't triathlons. And since then I did a few races, but like most people didn't like, nobody wants to hear like that the guy who can go like low four hours and a half iron man has to swim with one arm. Like you're going to just kind of piss people off. Um, <laughs> so, so like, I don't, I don't really tell a lot of people that. Um, but yeah, it's pretty frustrating. And now with my ankles, it's like, I had run 90 days in a row when I blew up my ankle the last time. And I was like, finally getting healthy enough to like kind of run and, um, bike racing is probably what I could do the best at, but I don't really jive with like the whole, like road. I'm, I'm a relatively good road racer. Like I've won a state championship in the one twos and, um, like I, I can hang or I, I used to be able to hang. Now I hang over my bibs, but um <laughs> i mean it's true they're tight but uh but uh they're supposed to be <laughs> no they're a little too tight but um, <laughs> yeah um so yeah I, I, probably not but or not not seriously i do want to do a marathon but like i just don't know if my ankles are gonna be able to hold up mm -hmm. got it yeah yeah i'm sorry to hear that injury stuff yeah injury stuff sucks yeah mm -hmm. live vicariously but um i do i do kind of want to be able to do 50 pull-ups again like in a row um so maybe i'll do that but the more i train for that the more likelihood they're going to chop off my arm so we'll see oh my God. I'm, I'm a mess but i don't know i did a i, I did 100 push-ups in under a minute like 10 years ago so i think that would be another good one that one doesn't mess up my arm quite as much got it so. i don't think this i can definitely... do one pull-up <laughs> yeah if you if you re can. like because wrestling like before i was a wrestler i did gymnastics and so oh my god like, if you if you do those sports like yeah i don't know what was your event ever. oh i did like little kid gymnastics okay right? and then so by the time i got old enough to do events i was on to wrestling and soccer and all that stuff so. great i think we're going to subtitle this interview elliot bassett body horror <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like right. 55 minutes of muscle biopsy yeah. and amputation. Gravel yep. scar. <laughs> Basically. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an athlete, but yeah, when you when you put it like that, that's, I, 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 I do think that's one of the things that, that's helped. Like, there's not many things I ask an athlete to do that I haven't done myself or like yeah. done something way dumber than that. Um, <laughs> So like I have a lot of good like oh one like I've run a hundred mile weeks oh I've run I've ridden seven hundred fifty miles in a week like I I've done crazy long bike rides I've done ill planned fifty k's like I've done fifty k swim weeks like so uh, yeah so it's a, it's a good learning background you're, yeah uh, yeah like uh, I think Lydia like you're like Lydia like Lydia like was like maybe no, two hundred no. maybe maybe I'm two hundred miles that, I'm a week I'm not that dumb. I'm not that. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say I'm not that smart, really. But uh, yeah, it, but the interesting thing is if you read multiple editions of his book, you see his philosophy change. Mm -hmm. And like, you can still like, I mean, he's, he's been passed away. But like, I've sat down with Jack Daniels, Jack, actually, I'll never be the best coach from University of Montana, because Jack Daniels went to University of Montana. Um, and so, and of course, I've come back in, and some of my athletes know him through his, his kids. And so I got mm. to like sit down and have dinner with him and just like talk coaching. And like, you re I realized I was like, like this guy doesn't even believe some of the stuff in his books because his books have changed because he, he like, I was like, I was just like sitting here like this dude has forgotten like five times as much as I know. And most people I talk to, I'm kind of like, Oh, I've forgotten like three <laughs> times as much as that coach knows. And I'm just like, so like there's certain coaches where you're like, you kind of need to like, read in between the lines when you go from edition to edition of certain books and the more information you can get the better so. that's great very yeah, wise we'll words <laughs> i'm thinking to myself about how i uh, present coach molly hates previous coach molly now but um <laughs> really oh yeah no. for sure for sure like i look back at all of that stuff that i thought when i first got started in the sport and i'm like come on like <laughs> that was oh silly. yeah yeah 
I, yeah, I can see that. I, my early edition self, I think, was had a few strengths that I'm lacking now that I wish I could get back. Like what? Ooh, yeah, what? Do you yeah, think? you've got to tell us that. That's <laughs> yeah. got to be our last question. <laughs> oh, I was insanely enthusiastic, like, like the off the charts, like, oh my god, all I could talk about, like, I was obsessed with. Like I'm still obsessed with training, but now I know how to like, I don't know, tone it down. But I think a lot of like, when you asked about like UM triathlon, it was like, this guy is going to literally do anything we need. Whereas now I think it's like, yeah, I'll do anything you need, but like, it would help. Like, it's not going to be obvious. You might have to ask and then I'll say yes. So I think that's, um, yeah, I could use getting my enthusiasm back, enthusiasm back to like 150 out of a hundred would be nice. So. Well, I'm very glad we asked, will you come on our silly Twitch show? So <laughs> that the answer was yes. Thanks. Yeah, yeah this was uh, this was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're going to wrap it up now here because uh, we're coming to this. Yeah, the hour always goes by real fast. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank Chris. you so Thanks, much Molly. for coming on. Yeah, it was great yeah, to get to spend it. some time with you. This was just awesome. Um, and everybody out there, make sure you come back for Yoga with Amy VT tomorrow at 7.30 a.m., um, no spin on Thursday because we hope you are all eating turkey and or pie. Let's just go with pie. Everybody eats pie. Um, and uh, yeah, but we will be back for an endurance spin on Saturday morning. Um, make sure you follow Chris and I on Zwift. And Elliot, thank you so much. This was just, um, it was it was so fun to get to talk to you. Thank you for Thanks, making Molly. the time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take all right, care, we'll everybody. talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Thanks so much.